is uh, the custom. Uh, this will be more of like a philosophical talk in, in, a, in a sense of where I see nanopore fitting in to how we do microbiome science as a field. Um, so uh, thanks for the introduction and for mentioning it. I worked with Rob Knight, who does a lot of microbiome stuff at UC San Diego, and, uh, and, and got to like uh, struggle with a, a lot of really huge data sets with Rob. And one of the, the things that I really took away from the time was that as we go forward generating reams and reams of data, we need to make sure that we're generating data that can agglomerate. And what do I mean by agglomerate? Um, I mean that we need to generate data that we can then uh, produce a product that other people who are working on related questions can easily take and grow in, in ways that those uh, individual experiments will add up to one another. Um, and with the 16S microbiome data that we worked with with Rob, uh, there was sort of an interesting case study to me uh, with transitioning away from OTU clustering to unique sequence variants or amplicon sequence variants that I think really illustrates why this is important. So with Rob, I helped work on the Earth Microbiome Project, which was this big sort of collaborative uh, uh, project with, with many different PIs who solicited their own uh, data sets, their own sample sets that they were experts in and interested in. Um, they'd send them to us and we'd sequence them with 16S um, and generate a lot of different separate studies with the idea that then, you know, years later we'd come back and pool them all up and, and answer some interesting questions about microbial life on Earth. Uh, but we ran into this problem. Uh, with 16S data for a long time, we had been using these operational taxonomic units, which were a product of, of the sort of dual problems that there's a lot of microbial life out there that we haven't observed yet, and also our sequencing has some errors in it. So OTU clustering, as it's called, was a solution to try and solve both of these problems at once by reducing sequencing error and collapsing strain diversity at the same time. Um, and so what we would do is we'd sort of, uh, if we imagine the blue dots are, are, are true microbial sequences and the yellow dots are sequence errors, we'd sort of draw 3% or 1.5% radii around um, all of our, our, our sequences that we observe and we'd try to pick out sort of uh, centers or centroids of those clusters as our, as our, as our true representative OTU sequences. Um, but, uh, you can see that as you kind of, you know, if you're only looking at a couple sequences at a time, you have to do these all by all comparisons. And uh, as you increase the number of sequences you look at, the number of comparisons you have to make scales quadratically, which is really problematic when you're sequencing billions and billions of reads. Um, so uh, a couple really smart people that are not me have come up with really nice uh, computational ways to try and only solve one of these problems at once just addressing sequencing noise. So dblur and dada2 are two examples of tools that have, people have developed uh, to try and get rid of the sequencing error while leaving all of those closely related strain diversity. So let's see, I can, so you can see in the last one, this, yeah. So these are very close together, sequences are very similar, and if we were doing O2 clustering, we'd lump them together. Um, but with ASVs, amplicon sequence variants, we can still distinguish those closely related 16S sequences. And the really great thing about this, which was almost an afterthought of the initial goal, which was to try and resolve these closely related things, is that we can operate this independently per data set. So this really became a problem when we tried to aggregate all those different studies with the Earth Microbiome Project. When we were uh, doing our 97% O2 clustering, once we got to 10,000 samples, we were literally spending a month on our supercomputer cluster trying to generate those 97% OTUs. Because even though everyone had already analyzed those data sets with their own 97% OTUs, to compare them to one another, we had to redo that analysis. And it just broke our, our supercomputer. Um, it took three and a half months on, six, on a 64 core uh, node. But with dblur, we could get it done in a day. Um, and we could sort of easily parallelize it. So that meant that we had no upper limit on the size of an analysis we did, and we were able to look at these really big pictures of microbial diversity of life on Earth and find uh, cool patterns like, you know, animal-associated microbes are a really big axis of diversity, and we see all this like nice clustering by different habitat types. 
Um, and it really enabled us now to get kind of a microbe's eye view of the planet in a, in a new and cool way. This is one of my favorite plots from the EMP, um, which is a little bit of an inversion of a typical bar chart that you see with microbiome studies. Instead of every column in this chart being a different sample and the colors denoting different microbial taxa in that sample, each one of these bars is a different microbial taxon, in this case a different microbial AS amplicon sequence variant, and the colors denote the different habitats in which that microbe uh, has been found. So you can see that this microbe is pretty much exclusive, exclusively found in the plant rhizosphere. Pretty neat. Um, and, and so I've started thinking about these ASV sequences as like the true names of bacteria or like their phone number or something. Um, it's, a, it's a stable identifier that's actually a little segment of the genome of the bacteria. And regardless of whether I look at that bacterium today or tomorrow or, or here or in Colombia, uh, it's going to be the same name. And that means that I can make a little trading card for my particular DNA sequence here. And I can tell you which habitats that particular sequence is found in. And if I later go and do another analysis and I find another sequence that's just a little bit different, I can recognize it as living in very different habitats. Um, so that's a really, uh, a really nice property for these big collaborative studies because we can generate sequences now and then we can ask questions about them later without having to do additional computation or additional work. We can combine these studies um, and we can add to our combined studies without having to do additional global recomputation. And as we sort of sequence terabytes and terabytes of, of data, that's going to be even more important. Okay, so now the question is, how do we move beyond 16S, these sort of nicknames of these bacteria? Um, one approach that people have uh, long taken to doing metagenomics, I like to think of as JBOG, or just a bag of genes. Um, and uh, so there's a problem with the bag of genes approach, there's a number of problems, um, but one of the problems is sequencing cost. You have to do a lot of sequencing. So we'll just sort of go through some numbers. Imagine a gene we're interested in makes up a fraction of the genome, and that genome makes up a fraction of the diversity in the sample, and we want to observe the gene a few times to get some confidence. And we're talking we need 20 million Illumina reads uh, to be confident of finding that gene, um, which ends up being pretty expensive per sample. Um, and there's other problems, my least favorite of which is that genes within the genomes are highly autocorrelated, right? So we're looking at these genes independently, but actually it may be some other gene on the genome that's driving the distribution of that microbe, um, and we can get confused by, it, by looking at that. We're losing really interesting, rich information about uh, genomic content and evolution, sort of uh, uh, signatures of selection or uh, structure of genes with one another. Um, and it's not agglomerative. If I make a two terabyte data set for my samples, I'm like, all right, I'm going to upload it to NCBI and you want to use it, you're going to be, oh no, I have to download two terabytes of data from NCBI and rerun the analyses to compare it to my data set. And that sucks. It's not useful. Um, so another approach you can take is shallow shotgun sequencing. Uh, we can pretend the whole genome is a marker gene, and if we've got really good reference databases, we can actually do pretty good. So here's a 16S profile, here's a shallow shotgun sequencing profile calculated with just a, you know, a few hundred thousand shotgun reads from the same data set, and we see really nice patterns. Um, we can get really good correlations if we have good reference databases uh, between the, the, um, the true uh, keg genes represented in a data set um, and just 500,000 uh, subset, 500,000 read subset of the data set and the full 2.5 billion read uh, subset of the data. So we get really good correlations between sort of like predicted and observed genes. I mean, we really only need, you know, a million or a couple hundred thousand reads to get there. But again, this is really limited by reference genomes. It works pretty well if you're sequencing uh, sort of Western human guts, but if you're sequencing anything else, it's kind of garbage, it doesn't work. There are not nearly enough genomes available for most environments. Um, so really, what I think we need is a way to generate new useful references while keeping costs down so that lots of people studying lots of different things can generate new genomes to grow the size of our database. So the approach that, that I've been advocating is uh, something that 
And one of our collaborators decided it needed a, a cool name called the leaderboard sequencing. And it takes advantage of this sort of log uh, abundance scaling of diversity in most systems. So if you imagine each one of these is a separate sort of microbiome sample, and the colors denote different microbes, there are going to be some microbes that are really abundant in most, uh, most samples. And then there's going to be some microbes that are usually rare um, and maybe occasionally abundant. And if we take the sort of exhaustive sequencing approach and we invest a lot of money in a sequencing a few samples um, and getting all the genomes from those samples, okay, this time we're going to get the blue genome, we're going to get the yellow genome, we're going to get the red genome. Okay, so what we're saying is, well, maybe we'll take a different approach. Because things are often rare, usually rare, but occasionally abundant, let's try and sequence more samples shallowly. So now we're going to sequence more samples, and even if we don't have the depth to get the rare genomes in every sample, we'll still get uh, genomes that are abundant where they're abundant, and we'll get more information about the distribution of genomes across more samples. Um, and so here we're also going to pick up the green genome, even though we don't observe all of the rare genomes in every one of our samples. So. Um, Leaderboard sequencing is taking advantage of the fact that we can successfully assemble uh, draft genomes from multiple metagenomes. It also takes advantage of the fact that we've got more between sample information about how things are varying. That helps us with binning, gives us better draft genomes. Um, and we can only focus in on recovering genomes where they're relatively easy to recover. Um, and this only works if we can keep per sample libraries uh, low cost. So for a bunch of my time with Rob's lab, spent developing this like automated low cost way, blah, 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 it's luminous stuff, so we don't care that much about it. But we can get really nice libraries generated for, you know, just a couple bucks, bucks a pop, and then we can like pool them all on a Nova Seek and get tons of data, um, and it works better than sort of exhaustive sequencing of just a couple samples. This will be coming out soon in genome biology. Um, so what I've moved on to here is asking whether we can add nanopore or long read data to this sort of like low depth, highly parallel leaderboard sequencing uh, to really improve some of our assemblies and give us better genomes for the genomes that we do get. So people, other, many other folks have been working on sort of hybrid assembly of metagenomes and, and nanopore uh, assembly of metagenomes. So these are just a couple papers that have been looking at sort of, in this case, augmenting short read uh, data with long read data. And they find that, you know, even if you only have a little bit of coverage from long reads, you can really improve the assembly, even of relatively rare things in the genome. So that's nice. It's sort of, it's a good, a good sign that this might work. And we can also uh, close genomes using long read data that might be really highly fragmented or different, difficult to close with short read data. So here is a, here is a, a preprint uh, from Sanford, and they, they compared a long read assembly, which is this sort of purple outer ring, with 10x read cloud assembly, is this yellow ring, and then just a Lumina assembly with this inner green ring. Um, and for, these are just two random ones that I pulled from one of the supplemental fingers. You see that they're able to close some of these genomes with nanopore that they couldn't close with some of these other approaches. So um, the other thing I'm hoping to do with this is sort of targeting. So if we do an initial pass with our sort of cheap um, and broad Illumina data, maybe we'll be able to pick out some of our samples to go back and do more exhaustive nanopore sequencing on to kind of uh, flesh out our genome catalog to make sure that we get the ones that we really care about. So in this case, we're going to pick our samples, and then we're going to say, OK, well, in this sample, in this sample, in this sample, um, I've got relatively abundant populations of some of these weird genomes that I haven't assembled very well from just the short read data. Maybe I can go and just focus on those samples for my long read. Uh, and then here or some screenshots from the run that we've done. Uh, this is just a run that we did last week. I was mentioning the flongal earlier. Um, we've got some of these two-for-one deal flongal flow cells because they're having a hard time shipping them out. So they send us the, the duds that only start out with like 30% of the pores. Um, and even with that, we've been getting pretty nice yields of uh, you know 500 megabases or so uh, from our fecal metagenomes. And we're still struggling to get longer read length. So if anyone else is working on fecal metagenome samples um, and DNA extraction approaches, I'd love to 
touch base. Um, and so, you know, science, what I'm hoping to actually look at with this, um, my particular interest is in the evolution of specificity in gut microbes. So um, what makes gut, microbio, gut microbes in human gut different from gut microbes in, say, a chimpanzee gut? Um, is there something different about these different microbes? And uh, earlier we talked about with the Earth Microbiome Project, we kind of got this microbe's eye view of different habitats across the Earth, one of which was animal gut, which are these brown ones here. A lot of microbes found in the, only found in the animal gut and not other habitats. Um, we've also augmented this Earth Microbiome data set with a lot of other vertebrate data. And one of the really cool findings that, that, we're, uh, that we're seeing is that in the mammals, we have a lot of ASVs, a lot of microbes, that are really specific to individual lineages of mammals. So for instance, all these sort of baby blue microbes here are only ever found in the foregut fermenting herbivores, the Ceteriodactyla. Um, and so it's like cows, hippos, and whales, actually. Um, so there's a lot of microbes that are only found in those organisms. And a lot of other microbes are only found in primates or hindgut fermenting herbivores. Um, and there are some microbes that are pretty generalist, pretty cosmopolitan. They seem to be easily moving around between different lineages of mammals, but there are a lot of these specialists too. By contrast, we're finding that in birds, there are very, very few microbes that seem to be highly specialized to individual bird lineages. So for most microbes um, that we find in the bird guts at all, they're found in kind of like all of the different groups of birds that we've looked at. So we see a lot lower levels of host specificity in the microbes associated with birds. Um, and we know that some of the host specialist microbes in mammals are co-diversifying with their hosts. So uh, Andrew Muller, whose lab I uh, work with here at Cornell, has shown using targeted, specific, you know, quickly evolving target genes in a couple different lineages of bacteria that there are microbes that, that seem to be you know, more closely related among uh, different chimpanzee species than they are to gorillas or to humans. Uh, and so they seem to be following their hosts through evolution across time. And we also know from studies in mostly mice that some of the species specific microbes seem to have special roles in developing the host immune system, especially in the gut epithelia. Um, and some of the microbes that are uh, found in wild populations of mice, for example, uh, induce differences in response of hosts to things like drug trials. So if you take mice that have um, sort of conventional lab mouse microbiomes and you give them these uh, drugs, uh, they see these responses. Uh, but then when they go and try and uh, do those same drug trials in humans, they find that the drugs don't work. Um, but it turns out if you go back and you give those lab mice back their native microbiome, the drugs also don't work. So they would have been a better model if they had their endogenous sort of native microbiome. So there's all these reasons that I think that there's maybe something in these host specialist microbes that's important, and we don't know what it is yet. Um, so uh, what I'm doing here is taking a data set of a bunch of different North American mammals and trying to construct sort of a catalog of co-diversification and host specificity um, and getting as many good genomes as I can from as many of these species to understand how they've been evolving in the wild in these species. Um, so we're uh, collecting samples from wild and captive rodents across the US, teaming up with NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, which has this like really fantastic collection of samples that they're excited for people to, to work with um, so we can get we have 40, roughly 40 different uh, rodent species found in the US across many different sites. Um, some of these are also found in lab strains. So there's different paramiscus, uh, for instance, that have been in the lab for, for a long time. And so we can kind of compare native and wilds in that lineage of mice. Um, and then we can also, with this neon sample, uh, get samples of individual rodents that have been collected, gut microbiome samples or fecal samples that have been collected from the same individuals across time at some of these sites. So you can actually get some longitudinal information uh, and, and, and answer some questions about uh, longitudinal variation in the microbiome there. So this is just a quick plot of the samples we're hoping to get from NEON. Um, and this can also aid us in like, binning and genome assembly. 
Uh, so this is what we've got going on um, at Cornell. We're going to hopefully come out of it with uh, uh, some well-assembled genomes across many closely related species. Hopefully we'll be able to ask which microbial taxa co-diversify with their hosts. So which lineages of the microbial tree are host-specific and which lineages seem to move between hosts. Um, whether host specialists seem to have different gene content than, than cosmopolitan lineages, and maybe whether we can see differences in like, I don't know, effective population size or genes that are under selection in host specialists versus generalists that might uh, lead us uh, to, to raise some specific hypotheses that we could then go back and test in the lab. Um, and ultimately, uh, all of this work that I'm doing here is really about filling in the coevolution story in this branch of the vertebrate phylogeny. Um, it's just a small part. And so I'm really uh, hoping to do it in a way that generates nice, complete, uh, high quality genomes that then, if other people are working on primates or working on artiodactyls, or uh, you know, squamates or birds, um, and generating similar genomic data can easily take those and compare them to their host. And I think um, if we make data useful and agglomerating, a future discovery will be a lot easier. And um, we'll have to do less reanalysis of data. Uh, and I'm really thinking that the long read data, because it's going to give us much higher completion and higher quality metagenome genomes, hopefully, will be a key part of that. Um, and I don't really see any way of answering big questions about the coevolution of extremely diverse bacteria with extremely diverse host animals without sort of partitioning the labor in this way. Um, and so with that, thank you all for listening, and thanks to uh, especially Rob Knight, who supported most of the work that I talked about, and the many, many people in his lab, and also Andy Muller and Alana Brito, who I'm working with here at Cornell. Um, and yeah, thanks so much. We, we do have those, um, some of those samples, but we don't, we don't have a broad enough sampling that I feel comfortable making a, a, a stand on that. Um, we do find that they are closer to the mammals in terms of the overall composition, um, but just in terms of rough strokes. I, I don't have a way of polarizing the trait of Specificity. We can culture a lot of microbes um, from these samples, and actually, that's what other folks in Andy's lab are, are really working on. We've got an anaerobic chamber, and in parallel with this sort of metagenome survey, um, we're trying to get at least first pass isolate strain collections from as many samples as we can. Um, and so we're hoping that even if that's biased, it'll give us a nice sort of like, hopefully that'll give us a bunch of things in the freezer. And if we can find some examples that we've captured across different hosts, we'll have something ready to go experiment with is, is the goal. Yeah. I've sort of been looking at that, but I haven't seriously pursued it yet. If you've been doing any high C, I'd be really interested. And, and you were mentioning, well, maybe there's some uh, nanopore-related uh, methods in the future that'll be easy to do. But.